John Cunningham's drug empire was valued at $50 million. He had close ties to major Irish and Scottish criminals like Martin Foley and Chrissy Kinahan. The crime for which he is most famous involves kidnapping Jennifer Guinness from the family whose beer is enjoyed across the globe. Cunningham even pistol whipped Jennifer's husband when asking him for the ransom. The colonel, as people called him, was born in Ballyfermont Island. His life was rough, so Cunningham learned to use his intellect to outsmart everyone, even the Irish guard eye. He was quiet, calculating and cunning, a dangerous combo for a criminal. He was so smart that in just four years, the colonel built a $50 million drug empire in a foreign country. Here's how the Dutch public prosecutor described Cunningham at the time of his trial. This man looks like everybody's favourite neighbour, but don't be deceived by his friendly face and tidy appearance. The kidnapping of Jennifer Guinness was one of the most notorious crimes John Cunningham was ever involved in. As the wife of John Henry Guinness, the former chairman of Guinness Mahon, they were well known in Dublin. Guinness Mahon was a merchant bank and it was part of the Guinness dynasty that began with Arthur Guinness and his famous beer. Even though they were not directly related to the company, Henry and Jennifer had close ties to the fortune. The Guinness Mahon Bank was just a branch of the global conglomerate. John Cunningham knew the couple was loaded. After all, they were part of the company that started the Guinness Book of World Records. Henry was a proud businessman who took care of his family. His wife Jennifer was an English-born skilled yachtswoman who was a respected member of the Howth Yacht Club. So the colonel called his brother, Michael Cunningham, and a close friend, Anthony Kelly. They plotted the kidnap for days. They closely monitored the couple's activities and they decided the best time to strike would be when the woman was alone in the house. One afternoon in April 1986, Jennifer heard a knock at the door. She thought it was just one of her neighbours or her mailman, so she cordially smashed that like button, just like you should if you haven't done so already. But no, in all seriousness, Jennifer cordially opened the door. Her smile was immediately replaced by a horrific scream as three men wearing ski masks burst into the luxury estate yelling and pointing an Uzi submachine gun at her head. Jennifer and her daughter, Gillian, who was 23 at the time, were held at gunpoint. They were terrified. They struggled to escape, but it was pointless. She wished she had never opened the door. Her daughter's life was in grave danger and there was nothing she could do to stop it. The three kidnappers, unknown to Jennifer and Gillian, waited in the house for around 60 minutes. They were waiting for Henry to come back from work. You see, only someone as genius as John Cunningham could have orchestrated such a massive kidnapping without the involvement of the police. The Guinness family was well protected, but they lived in Howth, a fishing village overlooking Dublin Bay. The estate was large, no one could hear the initial screams of Jennifer and Gillian. Even if they did hear them, calling the police would be pointless because the village was located eight miles away from Dublin. This would give Cunningham and his associates enough time to escape the scene of the crime. After an hour of waiting, the front door opened. Henry walked in completely oblivious to what awaited him inside. One of his business associates came with him and both men were overpowered by the Cunninghams. Henry got pistol whipped and was mildly injured during the incident. Once they were certain he would no longer be a problem, the colonel turned to a beaten Henry and said, two million pounds, that's 2.6 million dollars, or you will never see her again. The three kidnappers grabbed Jennifer and Gillian and began dragging them out. Jennifer begged them to leave their daughter in the house. She promised she would remain silent if they did so, and for some strange reason, the colonel agreed. After they left, Henry immediately contacted the police. Superintendent Frank Hanlon was given the case. He thought that the outlawed Irish Republican Army was behind the kidnapping, but Henry only said that they had Dublin accents. Later, Hanlon said there was nothing in their demeanour that would indicate they were part of a paramilitary organisation. Again, this speaks volumes about the brilliance of the colonel. He knew that the police would never suspect him and his brother to be behind the kidnapping, so he used the police's bias against them. No one knew where Jennifer was, they didn't even know if she was alive or not. Cunningham and his brother kept the woman close by. They handcuffed her to Mike, chained her to a tree, tied her to a bed and crammed her inside a cardboard box in the trunk of the car of her three captors. Jennifer went through hell and back but she never lost hope. After an eight-day search, the guardie finally tracked her location. She was kept inside a house on Waterloo Road in Bullsbridge. After a full night of shouting with the police, they finally managed to get Jennifer. 
John the Colonel Cunningham, his brother Michael Cunningham and their friend Anthony Kelly were all brought to justice. The first one sentence was Michael, who received 14 years behind bars. His brother was next. He received 17 years in prison for orchestrating the kidnapping. The police also captured and sentenced Brian McNichol, who was convicted for providing the house where Jennifer Guinness was kept. Even though they never got their $2.6 million ransom, this kidnapping cemented the colonel as one of the most dangerous and feared criminals in Ireland, and they never planned on staying inside the prison for long. In prison, he was a commendable inmate. He did so well that the colonel was waiting for early release, and that's when he decided to strike. Feeling like this would be the perfect time to escape, Cunningham hatched his new plan. He decided that it would be best to go to the Netherlands after serving 10 of his 17 years. So in 1996, he escaped and disappeared somewhere in the Netherlands. While in the Netherlands, he began working closely with Martin Cahill, aka the General, and Gilligan. Together, these three men built a massive drug empire in less than four years. At the height of his success, Cunningham was worth an astonishing 50 million euros. The colonel even bought a luxury villa for himself close to Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands. Cunningham moved his family there, and he ran the operations of his drug cartel right under the police's nose. The luxurious villa had a vast estate, an outdoor swimming pool, numerous bedrooms and bathrooms, so Cunningham was living like royalty for some time. But it all came crashing down at the start of the new millennium. The authorities caught Cunningham and they brought him to justice. He was convicted of smashing that subscribe button and ringing the notification bell. But no, in all seriousness, he was convicted of trafficking 10 million euros worth of drugs between Ireland and the Netherlands. With the towering evidence they had against Cunningham, the trial went smoothly and they found the colonel guilty of trafficking ecstasy, cannabis and amphetamines. He was then moved to Limerick Prison in Ireland. He was supposed to live out the rest of his sentence there. When his sentence ended in 2007, Cunningham immediately moved to Tala, and then he moved to Costa del Spain in 2009. Almost all info about Cunningham gets lost after moving to Spain. The only information released about Cunningham was that he attended the funeral of his brother Michael in January 2015. Michael Cunningham passed away in 2015 at the age of 65. He was inside his home in Ballyfermont when a massive heart attack ended his life. The ceremony took place at the Church of Our Lady of the Assumption at Ballyfermont. He was even seen together with Martin Foley and Troy Jordan. Right now, Cunningham is the only one alive, even though no one knows his exact location. Knowing that he might be hiding in Spain gives the Irish Police Department some solace. Kelly, on the other hand, died back in 2005 from an unknown illness. Only the colonel survived the cold grip of death, and to this day, no one knows where he is. Bye for now.